Greetings, and welcome to the Home Depot third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Isabel Jancy. Please go ahead. Thank you, Christine, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Home Depot's third quarter 2022 earnings call. Joining us on our call today are Ted Decker, Chair, President, and CEO, Jeff Kinnaird, Executive Vice President of Merchandising, and Richard McVale, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Following our prepared remarks, the call will be open for questions. Questions will be limited to analysts and investors. And as a reminder, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. If we are unable to get to your question during the call, please call our Investor Relations Department at 770-384-2387. Before I turn the call over to Ted, let me remind you that today's press release and the presentations made by our executives include forward-looking statements as defined in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations and projections. These risks and uncertainties include, but are not limited to, the factors identified in the release and in our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Today's presentations will also include certain non-GAAP measures. Reconciliation of these measures is provided on our website. Now, let me turn the call over to Ted. Thank you, Isabel, and good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us on our call this morning. Sales for the third quarter were $38.9 billion, up 5.6% from the same period last year. Comp sales are up 4.3% from the same period last year, and our U.S. stores had positive comps of 4.5%. Diluted earnings per share were $4.24 in the third quarter, compared to $3.92 in the third quarter of last year. From a geographical perspective, each of our 19 U.S. regions delivered positive comps versus last year, while Mexico posted comps above the company average and Canada below the company average, both in local currency. The team has done a fantastic job serving our customers while continued to navigate global supply chain disruptions, inflation, and a tight labor market. This quarter also marked another active hurricane season. As they always do, our associates and suppliers did an incredible job supporting those in the path of both Hurricanes Fiona and Ian, and our thoughts continue to be with those impacted by these storms. Our results in the quarter reflect continued solid demand for home improvement projects. While we did see some deceleration in certain products and categories, as Jeff will detail, the project business remains strong across most of our departments. We also saw year-over-year -year growth with both our pro and DIY customers in the quarter. While the business performed very well and our consumer remains resilient, we are navigating a unique environment. We can't predict how the evolving macroeconomic backdrop will impact our customer going forward. However, we continue to closely monitor elasticities and trends across our business and believe we have the tools, team, and the experience to effectively manage in any environment. Despite near-term uncertainties, we believe the long-term underpinnings of demand for home improvement remain strong and that we are well positioned to leverage our distinct competitive advantages to capitalize on compelling growth opportunities in our space. We are pleased with the traction we are seeing in our interconnected business as we continue to build on our momentum with both our pro and DIY customers. For example, as we add better functionality and capabilities in our Home Depot app, we see greater engagement. In fact, throughout the year, we have seen strong double-digit growth in monthly active users versus last year. The growth is attributable to several enhancements we have made, including an improved online experience for our pro loyalty program, the seamless connectivity we've provided for our military program, and the launch of our new store mode feature, which makes navigating the store and interacting with products much easier. These enhancements translate to less friction of our customers 
as they navigate the digital world and connect to the physical world. We also remain focused on driving continuous improvement in productivity within the four walls of our store to enhance both the associate and customer experience. We are currently launching a new application on our in-store mobile devices called Sidekick, which is an in-aisle tasking tool designed to direct associates to the highest value tasks in real time. The tool will direct associates to key bays where on-shelf availability is low or outs exist. By simplifying our operations, we can generate productivity, enhance both the customer and associate experience. For the pro customer, we remain focused on investing in an ecosystem of capabilities, including enhanced fulfillment, a more personalized online experience, as well as other business management tools to drive deeper engagement with these customers. While we are focused on removing friction from the shopping experience, we are also onboarding capabilities to help our pros run their businesses more efficiently. Our pros tell us that finding qualified, skilled labor is a pain point in their business. To that end, we recently announced our Path to Pro platform, connecting skilled tradespeople with hiring trades professionals. This unique and proprietary platform is available at no cost to all ProExtra members. It already contains thousands of candidates, and pros have begun posting their open jobs. Our team remains focused on what is most important, our associates and customers, our merchants, store and met teams, supplier partners, and supply chain teams did an outstanding job delivering value and service to our customers throughout the quarter. I'd like to close by thanking them for their dedication and hard work. With that, let me turn the call over to Jeff. Thank you, Ted, and good morning, everyone. I want to start by also thanking all of our associates and supplier partners for their ongoing commitment to serving our customers and communities. As you heard from Ted, during the third quarter, we continued to see solid demand for home improvement projects and strong execution from our teams and supplier partners. Turning to our comp performance during the third quarter, 11 of our 14 merchandising departments posted positive comps. Bill materials, plumbing, lumber, millwork, paint, and hardware had comps above the company average. All other departments, with the exception of appliances, flooring, and indoor garden, were positive, but below the company average. During the third quarter, our comp average ticket increased 8.8% and comp transactions decreased 4.4%. The growth in our comp average ticket was driven primarily by inflation across our product categories, as well as demand for new and innovative products. Inflation from core commodity categories positively impacted our average ticket growth by approximately 200 basis points during the third quarter, driven by inflation in bill materials, lumber, and copper. Big ticket comp transactions, or those over $1,000, were up 10.1% compared to the third quarter of last year. We saw big ticket strength across many pro-heavy categories like fasteners, pipe and fittings, and gypsum. During the third quarter, both pro and DIY sales growth were positive, with pro outpacing DIY. We're encouraged by the continued momentum we are seeing with both our pro and DIY customers. In addition, our pros tell us their backlogs remain strong. During the quarter, our project business remained healthy. This can be seen in the double-digit comp performance of our bill materials, plumbing, lumber, and millwork departments, as well as in other categories like fencing, siding, conduit boxes and fittings, tubs and showers, and cabinets. We're also encouraged by the momentum we continue to see with our larger pro customers. These medium to large repair or modeler pros continue to post strong double-digit comps. We believe we are building a unique interconnected pro ecosystem that will increase our ability to grow share in a $450 billion addressable pro space. To serve the pro, it's about removing friction through a multitude of enhanced product offerings and capabilities. We feel confident that the investments across our pro ecosystem are resonating and that we continue to gain share with this important customer. As you know, we've been on a journey to remove friction from our interconnected shopping experience. A great example of this was our announcement in December of 2017 to own more of the appliance delivery end-to-end. -end. And in the third quarter, we achieved an important milestone. We now have 100% of our appliance delivery volume managed through our market delivery operations. This has significantly improved the customer experience. On-time and complete deliveries have increased meaningfully, 
and customer satisfaction metrics have increased by approximately six percentage points compared to the third quarter of last year. Turning to total company online sales, we are very pleased with the performance of our digital assets. Sales leveraging our digital platforms increased nearly 10% compared to the third quarter of last year. This was driven by our continued investments which are resonating with our customers. For example, during the quarter, lead times improved across different fulfillment capabilities which drove greater conversion. For those customers that chose to transact with us online during the third quarter, approximately 50% of our online orders were fulfilled through our stores, a testament to the power of our interconnected retail strategy. We're excited about the holiday season. During the third quarter, we hosted our Halloween event and could not be happier with the results. 2022 was a record sales year for our Halloween program, both in-store and online, as our customers continue to add to their collection with our unique and exclusive assortment. As we turn our attention to the fourth quarter, we intend to continue this momentum with our annual holiday, Black Friday, and gift center events. Our teams have sourced the most compelling artificial tree assortment we have ever had, which makes it easier for our customers to find the perfect tree for their holiday. In terms of our decorative holiday program, we couldn't be happier with our industry-leading assortment with extraordinary features and functionality that looks great and also reflects exceptional value. In our gift center, we continue to lean in, into brands that matter most for our customers. With our assortment of Milwaukee, Ryobi, Makita, DeWalt, Rigid, Husky, and more. Earlier this fall, we launched the next generation of the Milwaukee Drill and Drive M18 fuel lineup, offering more power, runtime, and increased safety for our customers. In our gift center, we are featuring this innovation in combo kits with four tools and two tools. And we have our exclusive rigid four tool, 18 volt brushless combination kit with two free tools, all backed by our lifetime service agreement. And in appliances, we have exciting offers on LG, Samsung, Bosch, Whirlpool, GE, and Frigidaire. We have multiple exclusive offers, including the LG side-by-side -side refrigerator with Kraft Ice, a great innovation in ice making. As with prior years, we've extended this, these events over several weeks, and we believe we are well positioned with the right brands, the right inventory, and a great customer experience. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Richard. Thank you, Jeff, <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. In the third quarter, total sales were $38.9 billion, an increase of $2.1 billion, or 5.6% from last year. During the third quarter, our total company comps were positive 4.3%, with positive comps of 7.1% in August, 4.4% in September, and 2.1% in October. Comps in the U.S. were positive 4.5% for the quarter, with positive comps of 7.2% in August, 4.2% in September, and 2.5% in October. On a three-year basis, Monthly comps were consistent across the quarter. In the third quarter, <clears throat> our gross margin was approximately 34%, a decrease of approximately 10 basis points from last year, primarily driven by supply chain investments. We continued to successfully offset significant transportation and product cost pressures while maintaining our position as a customer's advocate for value. During the third quarter, Operating expense as a percent of sales decreased 18 basis points to 18.2%. Our operating expense performance was in line with our expectations, which reflected continued wage investments as well as planned investments designed to drive efficiency in our store environment. Our operating margin for the third quarter was 15.8% compared to 15.7% in the third quarter of 2021. Interest and other expense for the third quarter increased by $80 million to $406 million due primarily to higher long-term debt levels than one year ago. <clears throat> In the third quarter, our effective tax rate was 24.4%, down from 24.5% in the third quarter of fiscal 2021. Our diluted earnings per share for the third quarter or $4.24, an increase of 8.2% compared to the third quarter of 2021. During the third quarter, we opened three new stores, one in the U.S. and two in Mexico, bringing our total store count to 2,319. 
Retail selling square footage was approximately 241 million square feet. At the end of the third quarter, inventories were $25.7 billion, up $5.1 billion compared to the third quarter of 2021. Inventory turns were 4.3 times, down from 5.4 times last year. And our inventory growth primarily reflects product cost inflation and strategic decisions in response to continued global supply chain disruption. Turning to capital allocation, after investing our business and paying our dividend, it is our intent to return excess cash to shareholders in the form of share repurchases. During the third quarter, we invested $770 million back into our business in the form of capital expenditures. And during the quarter, we paid approximately $1.9 billion in dividends to our shareholders, and we returned approximately $1.2 billion to shareholders in the form of share repurchases. Computed on the average of beginning and ending long-term debt and equity for the trailing 12 months, return on invested capital was approximately 43.3%, down from 43.9% in the third quarter of fiscal 2021. Now I will comment on our guidance for fiscal 2022. As you heard from Ted, we are very pleased with the solid performance we saw during the third quarter. Today, we are reaffirming our guidance for 2022. We expect comp sales growth of approximately 3% for fiscal 2022. We expect comp sales to be positive for the fourth quarter. We expect our fiscal 2022 operating margin to be approximately 15.4% for the year. And we expect mid-single digit percentage growth in diluted earnings per share compared to fiscal 2021. As we've said throughout the year, we find ourselves in a unique environment with many cross currents. We're operating in a broad-based inflationary environment not seen in four decades while managing through constrained global supply chain conditions all against a backdrop of monetary policy shifts intended to moderate demand. To date, our customer has proven resilient. We feel confident that we will continue to manage with flexibility through a dynamic environment while growing faster than our market and delivering exceptional shareholder value. Before opening the call for questions, we are pleased to announce that we will be holding an investor conference on June 13, 2023, in New York City. We will share more details in the near future, but for now, please hold the date. Thank you for your participation in today's call. And Christine, we are now ready for questions. Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Michael Lasser with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. Thanks a lot for taking my question. The sentiment and narrative around your stock is so heavily focused right now on factors that are out of the Home Depot's control, like the state of the housing market and its ultimate impact on home improvement demand. So can you help frame what is in your control? If home improvement demand, for example, was down 5% next year, is the state of your initiative such that Home Depot could gain a couple hundred basis points of market share, and in that environment, you'd only be down, call it, 3%. And if your comps were only down 3%, given the flexibility that you have with your cost structure coupled with your uh, current capitalization that affords you to buy back a lot of stock, you could actually grow earnings in that sort of scenario. Hey, good morning, Michael. Um, Thanks for the question. Uh, a lot of detail there that um, I won't get into specifics, but but assure you that you know we look forward to taking share in any environment. 
there is a lot of noise um, around housing and home improvement, and, and you've heard some of this before, but if I, I can just step back a minute and lay out the environment the way we see it. I mean, we still feel very good, Michael, about our business. We just reported another strong quarter and reaffirmed our guidance for the year. And remember, we've grown this business $47 billion in the last two and three quarters year. From our core customer, we think our customer is still healthy. I mean, our customer tends to have a good job, growing wages, strong balance sheets. They own their home and have seen increased home equity. However, as Richard said in his prepared notes, I mean, it is, it is a unique environment. with Lots of cross-currents of inflation and rising interest rates, et cetera. But given all that, our customer has remained resilient and engaged. As we said, both our pro and DIY customers grew again in this past quarter. Project demand in particular is very strong. Our pro sales are strong, and our pro intercepts with our customers indicate that their backlogs are still very healthy. Customers are still spending lots of time at home. We're not all back at work five days a week. These homes continue to age and they're worth 40% more than they were pre-pandemic. Now, I'm sure we'll get into some housing questions. In housing, values may go down a bit, but we're still going to be up meaningfully on a two-year basis. We did see some deceleration in certain products and categories. And again, that's, that's difficult to get at a root cause. Is it, is it a consumer pulling back in general? Is there a reaction to price inflation? Do we have some pull forward in certain categories that people bought so much of certain categories during the pandemic? Or are they moving on to other projects? Our transactions have been stronger than initially thought with this inflation. I mean, that's why we have, we have raised guidance throughout the year is that the price sensitivity wasn't as strong as, as we thought it would be. However, our guidance implies that fourth quarter comps will be the lowest for the year, albeit positive, and we have tougher comps from Q4 last year. So with all that as a backdrop, I mean, as I said in my comments, we believe we, we have the team, the strategy, the initiatives with each of our consumer and pro that we'll continue to take share in any operating environment. And while there, there may be some, some of these cross currents in this next X quarters, in, in housing, we still feel the backdrop of housing, the fundamental shortage of housing in this country and the aging of homes is incredibly strong for our space in the medium to long term. That, that, that's very helpful framework. Um, but in light of some of the deceleration that you're seeing, uh, one might assume that that might be a prelude to what, what could be a, a more pronounced deceleration into 23, especially as some of the material benefit from inflation that the Home Depot has experienced this year fades. So is it best to recalibrate our expectations and, and, and think and model more about a negative comp in 2023 for the Home Depot, even if it's just slightly negative? Well, well, we'll talk about 23 um, after our fourth quarter earnings call in February. You know, again, we, we, we remain incredibly bullish. Um, there are certainly factors outside of our control. It, you know, it, are the Fed actions going to ultimately, you know, take us to a recession? If so, how deep that might be? Those are things that, you know, we're, we're all wrestling with and, and everyone has an opinion but we're focused on what we can control, rolling out our strategies, delighting our customers, and taking share in any environment. Thank you very much, and have a great holiday. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Simeon Gutman with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, focusing on housing. So housing metrics are decelerating much quicker than your comps or your comp stacks. Is, is this just a lag effect? Um, I don't know if this, this lag is longer than other lags. Or, and Ted, you just made the case that, that maybe sales decouple from these metrics. 
I assume it's temporary because of home equity and we're spending more time in our home, or are you suggesting that maybe it's not temporary because we're spending more time in our home? So, Simeon, it's, it's Richard. Good morning. Uh, just to maybe sort of put some further points on, on Ted's backdrop, you know, a lot is made of, of home prices and, and it, you know, home price appreciation, the change in home price appreciation, we think has always driven home improvement demand and we've, we've held that view for a long time. But what we also really ran into, even I'd call it the middle part of the last decade, was that as, uh, as, as home prices began to uh, call it, become more steady, um, price discovery, in our view, became a little bit harder. And so the question has always been, number one, is there a lag to spending? Are you going to spend in that specific period when you know your home price is appreciated? Or is there a halo effect that lags over multiple periods? And our hypothesis is yes. That's what we saw in the last decade. Um, and I think that that just... Uh, sort of holds true from an intuitive perspective. But I think there's another, there's so many points that are important. And you know, I think we are all somewhat anchored to what we observed in 2008 and nine. And many of the folks on this call, in fact, almost all of us were here uh, during 2008, 2009. You had a situation where 25% uh, of homeowners were underwater on their mortgages. You had really a relationship that we saw in our comp sales driven by acceleration in foreclosures. So it, it, it wasn't, we, we were not in a period of home price depreciation that you're talking about single digits. We had a massive price correction in 2006 to 2008. There was price discovery every, every single day on the front of the newspaper and millions of forced sellers that were creating that price discovery. When I look at the situation now, as Ted said, we have home price appreciation of essentially 40% year over year. Uh, sorry, over the last three years. In fact, year over year, home prices are up 13%. Since December, home prices are up 8%. It is decelerating, but I think if you ask uh, or you, you, you listen to most observers, I think most people are calling for, if there is a correction, a modest one. So my question is, how will the price discovery occur? And then second, is, is that price depreciation actually meaningful enough to change folks' spending behavior? Because as Ted said, if you're a homeowner, you've done quite well from a balance sheet perspective. You likely have a job. You likely have cash in the bank. And then we're seeing another just interesting uh, dynamic where with mortgage rates increasing, our customer is becoming more and more likely to stay in place and begin a project, so improve in place. And so just sort of going back to the health of the, the homeowner back in uh, over a decade ago, 25% of mortgages were underwater back then. Let's look at the credit standing of the housing stock of the U.S. now. Of owner-occupied households, 40% are owned outright, no mortgage. Of those 60% that do have a mortgage, 90% of those mortgages are fixed rate. 73% of those mortgages are fixed rate below 4%. So we are now seeing a dynamic of stay in place and improve your home. And that's what our customers are telling us, and that's what the pros are telling us their customers are telling them. That's helpful. Um, a follow-up on another very easy to forecast variable, inflation. Um, can you can you frame maybe what percentage of your sales could be at risk from disinflation? Is it a hundred, or it shouldn't be a hundred because some parts of of of, of your of your product mix um, aren't going to be vulnerable? I mean, hey, it's, good morning, it's Jeff Kinnaird. Uh, we're watching inflation very carefully. Uh, we have seen some deceleration in inflation in the recent months. Which is, which is good for our consumers, but broadly we are still experiencing some inflation in some specific categories. 
Um, I'll call it the lumber market. We have seen a deflationary market in lumber over the recent weeks. In fact, we've seen a lot of stabilization in that industry uh, versus the prior two years. I did call out an impact from inflation in lumber for the quarter that was more representative of the early days, early days in the quarter. But we're looking at it carefully. We're managing category by category. We're working closely with our suppliers in terms of managing costs and cost components. We have a, a very good and deep understanding of virtually all cost components of all products that we sell. And again, we're, we're managing it uh, very closely. Thanks very much. Our next question comes from the line of Chris Horvers with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. So maybe um, to summarize your comments today, I guess it, it's that you're, you are incrementally more cautious because you're seeing certain categories maybe become slowing or, or more volatile, but it's not dramatic and it's more the uncertainty of what the Fed you know, the Fed's rate uh, raising is going to uh, affect the business in the future, potentially. That's, yeah, I think that's a fair representation, Chris. Okay. And then, uh, you know, so can you talk about some of the KPIs you're watching? You know, I guess what categories specifically are concerning you? Are you seeing DIY trade down? Uh, are you seeing maybe unit trends in the project business slowing? It seems like you know, the commodity inflation is driving some of, some of your best project categories. And, and are you seeing a more sort of volatility from the consumer, I guess, over the you know, past couple months that, that is adding that element of caution? Well, I, I would say, you know, the, the healthiest thing we see, and as you can imagine, we look at, you know, every, every data set and by geography and category, et cetera. The, the healthiest thing about the business is the project nature of the demand. You know, we are a project-oriented business, and you know all the categories that, that Jeff called out that is that is driving um, that project demand remains incredibly strong. And we look at it with both our pro customers, you know, we household pros versus consumers. And that project demand remains strong with each of the pro and the consumer. You know, some of the, the caution is, and, and again, you know, was it pull forward? Is it finally some price sensitivity on some of these, you know, whole good items? You know, we've talked about certain appliance categories or, or grills. You know, those, those definitely have, have come off the boil. And, you know, again, is it is everyone has purchased in the last three years a lot of those categories and they've, they've moved into more project and home improvement? Or is there, you know, a reaction to, to inflation? That, that's what's a little harder to tease out. Here's a case in point. You look at our indoor garden business. Um, two, two big categories you might say are more discretionary, grills and patio. You know, grills, you know, w was down, but patio, we had one of the strongest patio quarters that I can remember. So there are definitely some mixed signals. It's it's definitely caught our attention, and, and that's why we're cautious. I guess just following up, you talked about consistent – uh, three-year trends over the month. You know, obviously October was an incredibly strong uh, month last year. I guess you know, is it was that just you know, we've heard a lot about the consumer shopping early last year and the holiday season is normalizing. To what extent do you think maybe the, the election has had an impact on the business in November and and just overall, how are you thinking about you know the positioning today and then into the holiday season? Without Jeff. Yeah. Jeff Kinnaird, um, look, you know, we see some normalization back to 2019 in terms of the consumer trend. In the last couple of years, we've seen pull forward um, in, in concerns of supply chain driven shortages across retail. Um, so we do see, we do see um, potentially just a return back to kind of a more normal holiday spend by the consumer. Um, as I I commented in our prepared remarks, we feel very good about our Black Friday, our gift center, our, our, our decorative holiday assortments, and uh, we're excited about the, the overall Black Friday season. And just in case you don't have the numbers in front of you, you know, Chris, you, you called out 
monthly cadence. So really our, our comps were consistent across the month, so not just a three-year but also a two-year basis, just keeping in mind that last year's comps in August, September, and October were 3-1, 4-5, and 9-9 sequentially. So, you know, if, if you look at it on a two- or three-year basis, maybe smoothing some of that out, you know, the, the one-year months don't tell you quite as much. Got it. That's very helpful. Thanks very much. Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Zacone with City. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions, guys. Congrats on the strong results. To follow up on Chris's uh, commentary about the uh, recent performance, has there been any impact from the uh, hurricane recovery spend to call out maybe the end of the third quarter and thus far in 4Q? It was it was relatively minimal, so we think we had about $120 million impact from, from hurricanes this quarter, but keep in mind we were overlapping uh, a similar amount from last year. So these hurricanes and storm impacts um, extend across quarters. You know, what we're more concerned about is, is the health and safety of our customers and our associates, and our, our minds and, and, uh, and hearts are certain with them right now. Okay, thanks. Um, a lot of discussion around the top-line outlook given the housing uncertainty, but I wanted to focus on margin. You know, I know there's not a target in place on a multi-year basis, but can you help us think through the levers to protect margin rate if sales growth were to weaken in the future? I guess specific to gross margin, is there an opportunity for gross margin rate improvement as supply chain costs ease? For managing uh, margin closely, Stephen, uh, we look at it quarter on quarter. There's a lot of ins and outs um, when it comes to when it comes to uh, margin um, uh, as we look forward. At, you know, we look. I, I just add that we we think we have the tools and the experience and the people to manage price and cost uh, as well or better than anyone else here. Uh, we've proven that over the last three years. There's been immense disruption right in, a, in our uh, value chain, and yeah, I think the proof is in the pudding when you look back at our history. Great. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Scott Ciccarelli with Truist. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I think everyone here kind of understands there's some uncertainty around the broader home improvement environment, uh, given what's happening with interest rates. But how are you guys thinking about the, the growth potential uh, prospects of the large pro business as we roll to 23? Because you guys will obviously have a lot more infrastructure and more relationships built at that stage. Thanks for the question, Scott. That, I mean, we, we couldn't be more excited as, as we've identified a, a $450 billion addressable market and an understanding of what capabilities we need to deliver to get a larger share of wallet with that large pro repair remodeler. I've, I've been here, as, as you may know, over 22 years, and, and we've always known what we needed to do to capture or share a wallet with that pro. Um, and what's so exciting is that Hector and his team right now are actually building out the capability set to get more share of wallet with that large pro. And as we build out these capabilities, introduce them to the customers, we're seeing the engagement and the incrementality of sales growth um, take off. And Hector, if you give us a little more insight of what you're building, it would be great. Yeah, Scott, just, uh, we continue to be super excited about uh, the response from our pros as we continue to enable capabilities to remove friction from our ecosystem. I'm very excited about the expansion of our outside sales resources and the growth that those customers are driving. Uh, we're seeing those customers grow, not just with direct sales with our outside, outside sales associates, but they're also engaging more on our digital platform and engaging more in our stores for that on-plan purchase. And as we continue to grow um, around other capabilities, whether it is in the B2B digital platform or in-store platform, we just continue to be super excited about the response of our pros. And we are just removing friction. We're removing friction from all the different channels, and our customers continue to engage with us more and more. 
is there a way to potentially size or at least for us to, you know, conceptually think about kind of what the potential revenue ramp is as these uh, capabilities get built out? I, you know, the, as Ted said, we're excited. One of the reasons we're so excited is because it's such a fragmented market, such a fragmented market of suppliers. Uh, and, and so we just think the opportunity is, is exciting and tremendous, and part of the excitement is it's hard to size. But, but I can say, I mean, we don't break out these numbers, but, um, you know, each of pro and consumer grew again this quarter, and, you know, the pro yet again grew meaningly um, faster than the consumer. And our large pro, the ones who are engaging with, with what Hector and team are developing, are growing the fastest yet. Very helpful. Okay, thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Chuck Grom with Gordon Haskett. Please proceed with your question. Hey, uh, thanks. Good morning. Uh, great quarter. Um, overall transactions down a little over 4%. I was wondering if you could unpack um, that for us across the pro and DIY customer base. I don't know if we we break that out, but, I, but the, the strongest, again, was the large pro. Okay. All right. Uh, no I, look, I'd, I'd say, I mean, the, maybe a way to put it, too, is our pros shop across our assortment, so you're going to sort of see similar dynamics, you know, ticket transaction across the business, generally speaking. Um, but as Ted said, the strength is, the strength is with the pro. Okay. Makes sense. And then on the, on the cost pressure front, uh, as costs start to ease, how do you think about the pricing environment? Do you think you and, and peers are likely to hold on to prices as costs start to moderate and, and, you, and you retain that margin as a result? Or are you likely to lower prices and, and try to maintain the same um, gross, mar gross profit margin dollars? Chuck, we, we, uh, we watch this very closely. Um, you know, we are the customer's advocate for value, and we watch the market and our competitors very closely. Um, I will say that there's been an enormous shift to uh, trading up to more innovation and more innovative products. We see that in our tool category. We see that in the outdoor garden business. We proceed across multiple categories. We still see that willingness to trade up for great value and a great innovation. But And on the, the cost side, um, Chuck, it's definitely easing. So you look at commodities in particular. Commodities have been down six, seven months in a row. You know, lumber is obviously way down from peaking at nearly fifteen hundred dollars to to now under five hundred um, from peak to current during this, this last three years. However, we still see inflation across the store. So while some will be coming down in certain categories with, with costs and retails. Our forecast at this point is that net inflationary cost pressures continue into 2023. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Nagel with Oppenheimer. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Nice quarter, congrats. Thank you. So my first question, I, I think I want to ask that uh, Chuck's question maybe a little, a little bit differently. But I mean, well, on, on, with regard to inflation, you know, what we've seen now for a while is you know, Home Depot has done a remarkable job of kind of strategically passing along inflation. So, Ted, you're, you've mentioned a few times now you're starting to see some inflationary pressures ease. Because the question I have is, you know, are you seeing or would you expect that as inflationary pressures ease, even if pricing doesn't necessarily go down, you see some type of elasticity in demand, meaning that unit demand would pick up in that type of environment? Well, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and you could say, hey, if, if elasticities weren't as, um, you know, sensitive on, on the up, would, would they also likely not be on the, the moderation? if you will, um, you know, it, it's, it's to be determined. Um, I think, you know, broadly, 
the price sensitivity wasn't as sharp as we expected the last two years. That's why you know we started each year with more or less a flat forecast expectation and it beaten that each of the past two years. On certain commodities, lumber, copper, wire, where we're pricing to market weekly, you see a much more classic reaction to, to price and unit productivity. With other categories, and, and I, I hate to, to bring up grills again, but you know there's some classic price points on some classic grills, and when we saw you know those those grills get up over six hundred dollars. You know we we saw a more dramatic drop off in engagement. And when Jeff and the team worked those prices down, you know even even to the low four hundreds and in for high four hundreds, low five hundreds, you saw a response with with unit productivity um, across the board. Though there has been, you know, and Jeff mentioned this, there has been so much innovation across our categories, and you think of the, the dramatic shift of outdoor power equipment in power tools and appliances and what the features and benefits of these products are, the technology embedded in these products. You know, not sure it's quite an iPhone, but you know, we're we're getting close to to power tools being, you know, in in that in that genre and People love the newness and the innovation. They're, they're albeit higher prices, but people are responding in, in buying. So I think it's it's a mix, Brian, a, across the, the categories, and that's what Jeff and our merchant teams do such a great job um, managing every day. The guy that, that's very helpful. And then my follow-up, and a quick one, just for Richard. Um, you, know, you gave us the, the cadence of comps through the quarter. And obviously, we saw the reiteration of guidance. But any commentary, more specifically, on just the, the trend in business here in, in, into Q4? You know, nothing in the first two weeks of Q4 changes our view on 2022 guidance. And as we said, we expect comps to be positive in the quarter. Got it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Our next question comes from the line of Zach Fadum with Wells Fargo. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Um, as you think about your DIY customers specifically and the well-documented challenges in the first half of the year, is it fair to say that your DIY customer improved on a one- and three-year basis this quarter? And as you think about consumer behavior in tighter economic and housing conditions ahead, is there a scenario where the DIY category outperforms pro as customers trade down or maybe pull back on bigger projects? Zach, I may have to get you to uh, repeat the second part of the question. On the first part of the question, look, we're, we're really pleased with our consumer uh, business through the year. You know, Q1, uh, we, we had what we always refer to as bathtub effect in some respects. Um, and so we had a seasonal impact to consumer in Q1 of this year. Q2 and Q3 have both been positive, and we're very happy with that business. Uh, could you, could you, would you mind repeating the second part of your question? Yeah, is there a scenario where DIY outperforms pro as, as customers trade down or pull back on bigger projects? Well, you know, I, I don't think that there's any way to conjecture that. I, I do think that, what we love about this business is it's all it's all in customer demand, regardless of the channel it appears through. Um, but you know, we we are we don't have a target pro penetration for the business. And what we've seen through cycles is that number one, we do very well with both, uh, and you can see some fluctuation between the two. But really, what we have to go on right now is what we're observing, which is the pro business uh, is leading the company that shows us that the demand for large projects is very healthy right now. And, and we, you know, someone asked this question before. I'm not sure we answered it. We are not seeing trade down. Um, you know, if, if you take my, my grill or appliance example, it, it's not that people ultimately bought and, and they traded down. I think it's that people have already purchased you know, in the past few years. And, and when, when people, you know, do purchase, again, 
they're 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 buying innovation. Our our Traeger business, for example, is in, incredibly strong, and as as they bring out um, innovation, customers respond. Got it. And when you think about your sixth straight quarter of transaction declines, and the fact that there is a more stable repair and maintenance component of your business. To what extent do you believe we fully cycled away from all the pull forward and excess discretionary category demand in 2020 and 2021? And when would you expect this to translate to a more normalized, positive transaction cadence? Well, you know, that, that's such a great question. And it, it's something, you know, we observe in, in build our theories of the case. When you go back, now, what are we, we're 11 quarters of, of this pandemic. And, you know, the first five, six, we had tremendous transaction growth, right? We all know the story of, of what happened. Not necessarily a lot of cost in inflation at that point. And then the last six quarters, you know, we start to lap that tremendous activity but also saw, for all, all the reasons we know, supply chain, commodities, you know, global cost pressures, we saw significant cost in our business, and comps were, were driven, as they were this past quarter, with, with ticket over transactions. What we see now, as you step back approaching three years, is our transaction run rate, our sort of three-year CAGR at this point, is more or less pre-pandemic rates. And you could look at that at one hand and say, wow, here's the slowdown. On the other hand, you know, Richard used the term holding serve. You can look and say, oh my gosh, this industry erupted with demand for a year and a half. Then it cycled significant cost increases, the customer hung in there and was resilient, and you're net over this three-year period up in transactions in units, despite what we believe you'll hold on to these price levels. I think that all goes back to my, you know, my opening comments of what is the dynamic of this overall industry and the health and the engagement level of this customer. And if we normalize from here, you know, gosh, more than great. You know, there's, there's obviously all these questions about, you know, recession that, that we can't answer any better than you all can. But when you digest and look back on what's happened in the last three years, you'd say, wow, that's a pretty incredible market segment. Appreciate the thoughts. Best of luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Mike Baker with DA Davidson. Please proceed with your question. Okay. Uh, hi. Thanks. Uh, appreciate the color you gave uh, on, on the fourth quarter outlook. But the it, you've done uh, such uh, such a great job improving your holiday business. Uh, in fact, in ten of the last thirteen years, your fourth quarter comp has been better than your third quarter comp, and, and by definition, that's occurring on tougher comparisons. Uh, can you talk about, you know, what you've done to make the fourth quarter such a bigger quarter for you and why that might be different uh, this year? Mike, hey, it's Jeff. Uh, yeah, we've had an exceptional uh, fourth quarter we've, we've in, in the past year. We've built the business um, on the backs of a decorative holiday. And, you know, we are the customer's advocate for value in that category, and, and we have great innovation and, great again, great value for our customers. Second, we've built the business of, of gifting uh, in our gift centers. And you look at the innovation uh, that we're delivering to our pro and to our consumer, it's exceptional. Um, I spoke earlier about the M18 uh, 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 Milwaukee uh, drill and driver combo kit. The innovation is just exceptional, as Ted, as Ted spoke to earlier. And then appliances. You know, appliances is a enormous category for the Home Depot. It's been a category that we've built uh, at an incredible rate. We're investing in capabilities, like I spoke earlier, in terms of delivery. We're investing in dot-com capabilities in terms of uh, our, our, our customers' uh, uh, willingness to, to review and, and purchase online. 
then I'd also say we're building a great uh, project and uh, business in, in the fourth quarter. The, the fourth quarter is a great time for a project. We see a lot of consumers painting, doing smaller projects around their home and getting ready for the holidays. And then finally, I'd say, you know, it's storage. Uh, storage and organization, we have an incredible storage event. Um, we gain our the customer's advocate for value when it comes to storage. Um, across the business. And then finally, you know, we built an incredible dot-com business. And, you know, this is, uh, uh, we called out the, the performance in Q3. We're expecting a great Q4 with Cyber Monday. And, and a big part of that is our digital performance, our app performance. I've got Jordan Broby here, our president of online. Uh, Jordan, you want to make a couple comments around the app? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I mean, Ted called out at the front. The experience is where what it's all about. We love the experience improvements we've made. A lot of it's around in-store connectivity. We talked about store mode. We talked about military. We talked about loyalty. We've got some features coming out on Pro for in-store checkout experience. And our customers really respond. I mean, we love the ratings in the App Store, 4.8 with Apple, 4.7 with Google. Um, but we see it in our numbers as well. Strong double-digit performance and, and growth in downloads and MAUs, monthly average users. In our traffic, it's our fastest growing online property. We're doing billions of dollars in sales through the app. We couldn't be more excited. Uh, great. If I could ask one more follow-up, you, your buyback did slow a little bit this quarter. Is that uh, maybe a function of, of higher borrowing costs, or, or how should we think about buybacks going forward? Thanks. Uh, you know, we we don't uh, ascribe to a, necessarily a smooth cadence of buybacks, and that will typically reflect just sort of how we think about working capital investment through the year and a cash buffer throughout the year. So there's really nothing to read into there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Our next question comes from the line of David Bellinger with MKM Partners. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks for the question. So going back to some of the category comments, are you seeing some evidence that the you'll call it more discretionary items are turning lower and at a faster pace. I know last quarter you mentioned some of those higher ticket, you know, $300, $400 Halloween items being pretty much as discretionary as it gets and performing pretty well. We saw some discounts on those items in the weeks preceding Halloween. So any indications that those you know, splurge items are, are starting to cool off and, and more quickly than the rest of the business? David, uh you know, we had we had the comments that earlier we had record sales both in store and online in Halloween. That included the infamous Skelly, which has been one of our best sellers in terms of, of the innovation and value we offer our, our customers that's really unmatched in the in the marketplace. And we couldn't be happier with our Halloween performance. If I turn to the fourth quarter, uh, we're really excited about our decorative holiday assortment. We've got great innovation and great value for our customers across the assortment, if it's trees, if it's lights, if it's decorations. Uh, we feel very good about the category, and our consumers are reacting exceptionally well to it. Got it. I, I have a skelly, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, my my follow-up, just on the inventory levels, how much of that growth is aimed at pro customers? So th is there a piece of that inventory that's not sitting in the stores? May maybe it's at facilities like in Dallas so that the number looks to be a bit more elevated to us at the store level. Just help us unpack the 25% inventory growth number and, and just get us comfortable that you aren't sitting on too much at this point, especially with some of the, the deceleration you're now seeing. Well, so like investment in, in inventory in our one supply chain facilities is certainly one of the, the factors in inventory growth year over year, but the primary factor is really just inflation. Uh, uh, as, as part of the, the inventory value. And then we made strategic decisions to land uh, inventory earlier in the year than we have prior. And really just to give you some, uh, some numbers around that and, and to reflect the fact we, we feel fantastic about our inventory position, in Q2, we grew our inventory 38% year over year. In Q3, that number dropped to 27% year over year. And actually, if you look throughout our history, we actually typically build inventory from Q2 to Q3. In this case, our inventory actually came down by $400 million from Q2 to Q3. Our inventory 
uh, is healthy and we're happy with our position. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate it. Christine, we have time for one more question. Thank you. Our final question will come from the line of Stephen Forbes with Guggenheim. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. Maybe just to follow up uh, or, or focus on the quarterly performance, if I, if I look at the, the press release, the selected sales data you know, obviously excludes HD supply. So curious, Ted, if you can expand on the performance of that asset in today's backdrop as it looks like it may be driving some upside to the overall performance of the business. Yes, yeah, Stephen, thanks. Yeah, another great quarter for HD Supply. We mentioned this last quarter, and they are, they are just doing a terrific job. Shane O'Kelly and his team um, are running, you know, the, the largest and in, in, in the best focused um, MRO business for multifamily housing and hospitality extended living, et cetera. Um, we are well, remain well ahead of all our financial projections and we made the acquisition. Their integration is, is tracking. They're integrating sales forces, customer um, uh, records, and now starting the work or on, on their way in the work of integrating the supply chain. So that one is, is um, just been a, been a terrific um, acquisition that we're super happy about. And then maybe just a quick follow-up uh, for, for Richard or, or, or Ted. Uh, given the performance, can, can you remind us on what percentage of sales uh, that business is today? And then as we, as we look at the sort of spread between comp and that sales growth, uh, any, any reason to, to think that the current you know, sort of year-to-date spread doesn't hold into the fourth quarter? Well, uh, we don't break HD supply out, but as Ted said, we're, we're um, so happy with it. Um, <clears throat> on the difference between sales and comp, we've always seen a gap there. It just, you know, comp reflects sales through the POS. Sales reflects sales as they're actually delivered or installed. You're going to see that number uh, vary. We'll probably, through the year, Sales will be a little higher than the comp, um, comp guide, but the important guide here is comp because that's our activity-based metric around sales. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Jancy, I would now like to turn the floor back over to you for closing comments. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for joining us today. We look forward to speaking with you on our fourth quarter earnings call in February. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day.